Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And with me again uh, is Professor Hugh White from Australia, a prominent strategist uh, who has been, you know, already a guest many times uh, at Strategy in Future. Mm, uh, hello, Hugh. How are you? Very, very well. How are you? Good to be with you. Yeah. B before we start recording, uh, we exchange the views that a lot of things have changed uh, in between since we last talk, uh, talked, and I don't even know what to start with. Uh, Hugh, maybe you start this conversation. Maybe you have some questions or, you know, just tell me what you think right away. I mean, uh, in, in what's well, going on. Jacek, where, where can we start uh, now, we, except with Ukraine? Um, you know, you and I have before discussed a lot the, uh, the com comparisons and contrasts between the strategic situation in Asia and the strategic situation in Europe, and particularly in your part of Europe, and now with this extraordinary drama unfolding on Poland's doorstep. I'd, I'd be so interested to hear how, how, how you feel that situation's unfolding and where it's taking European security. Is NATO really being revolutionised? Are, are your doubts about NATO resolved? Uh, uh, is there a is there a way forward in this crisis or is it as bad as it looks? Oh, it is interesting. It looks bad from, from <laughs> across the, the world, yes? Oh, it looks bad to me, i got to say, yeah. Yeah, could you expand? I, I promise no, I'll sure. tell you everything you wish, but just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in the box now, you know. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm in the box and I. it's really more interesting what people think out of the, you know, out right. of the world. <laughs> well, um, uh, look, I'd, 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 I'd say two things. Uh, the, the, the first is that, you know, all one's emotions um, uh, incline you to think that, that, the, that the outcome of the Prussian crisis must be that, that Moscow is defeated and pushed back and humiliated. But as a strategist, you think to yourself, that, that never works, that there is going to need to be some kind of accommodation that Russia's claims to being a great power are going to need to be recognised to some degree, to some extent. And how that can now happen, how, and in other words, how Europe can build a, a model of a future relationship with Russia, which is sustainable and, and therefore, if I can put it this way, acceptable to Russia, um, at least minimally acceptable to Russia, in a way that doesn't appear to reward Putin's um, uh, actions and the, not, just the, not just the action of the invasion, but the very uh, immoral way in which that invasion has been undertaken. Uh, it does seem to me to, pro to, to, to offer a really profound strategic dilemma for Europe and not one that I think Europe's, or for that matter, America's uh, political leaders have yet seemed to me to, got their head, to get their head around. I, don't, I can't see a clear understanding of where they think the end point is going to be, what kind of future relationship with Russia um, uh, Europe is now heading towards. And that does seem to me to be a very significant uh, problem. In the meantime, the Ukrainians are facing uh, a really sort of terrible daily tragedy. So it, that, 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 it, it all, to me, looks pretty bad to that extent. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting now in Warsaw, as we speak, yeah. which is uh, quite close to the Ukraine border, like yeah. 300 kilometers, uh, especially in, in the countries of the size of Australia. It seems like one step away from, from being. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just can tell you that things have changed here, mm. but more, I think more they have changed in Poland than uh, in NATO and uh, in the broad West, so to speak. Yeah. So let me start with the West. And this is, of course, yeah. my personal assessment I'm, or, or strategy in future assessment, so to speak. Uh, NATO, first of all, there was a deterrence, US and NATO deterrence uh, uh, failure. Okay. Yes. The question if this was a calibrated and intended deterrence failure, it's another story, so to speak. Mm. Okay. Uh, we can discuss whether you can really calibrate the deterrence failure, but in a way, second, we think that what, uh, what Russia did was a major dis miscalculation. In terms that uh, I was very pessimistic uh, prior to the war, yeah. 
like in the months leading to the war, I thought that Russia was achieving everything in terms of grand strategy it wished without resorting to the open war. Yeah. Yes. You know, control of the energy markets, influence in Europe, uh, U.S. perception perception of the United States as a declining power, uh, the balance, military balance of power, apparently in favor of Russia, and then they they started to move, mm. and they lost the Battle of Kiev. Mm. So NATO, the I mean, the cohesion of the West and NATO is really fragmented. The continental consolidation, of which always English-speaking, you know, uh, world ocean nations are afraid of, was much deeper than I thought before mm. the war, in terms of the structural interests of Germany and, and, and Russia. Mm. Uh, if you look at the energy, if you look at the other, you know, statements by the German government, this is really, for the intermarium countries here, I can tell you there will be no comeback to the European Union as it was before the war. Yes. So it is sending shockwaves. So NATO, US, you know, I mean, then there is a shock that the Ukrainian army has been doing that well, given. Yeah. You know. Now, speaking of Poland, very briefly, functionally, we are sort of at war. Yes. We, we took 3 million refugees and they are not in the refugee camps. They are in our homes. Yes. You know, if you talk about the Poland's grand strategy of the last 500 years, and this is your favorite subject, grand strategy of Australia and stuff, there are always two principles. Everything else is just the instrument of that. One is to keep Russia out of the European system of power. Yes. Which is very difficult to deliver. But for the majority of this time, we managed to do so. Usually you need to deliver it by war. Mm -hmm. Of course, in modern times, we didn't deliver that that well, except for the 1920 war. Yep. And after the demise of the Soviet Union, it happened. This miracle happened again. Yes. So Poland is functioning at war. We are sending everything to Ukraine. Ukraine would not su survive at war without Poland and yeah. our land border. Yeah. So we were afraid that the Russians would be attacking our, our border and our staging areas. Like big, big time. Yeah. yeah. And they still might, might not they? Of course. We are sending the equipment like crazy military mm. equipment to Ukraine. Mm. Uh, just, uh, just to tell you how close to war we are, it's like uh, already a few million Ukrainians were working in Poland prior to the war, including oh. the construction sites. If you go to the yeah, metro yeah. construction site in Warsaw, people were speaking Russian and Ukrainian, you know, yeah, yeah. and the construction site. And suddenly, with the war, they are gone yes. because they all came back to sign up for the military. Yes. So it has a huge impact on the Polish economy. Mm. I could, I, you know, I, I, I could talk very long about it, but what I want to say is that the, my, the, the last uh, statement on my side on that topic, with the uh, Battle of Kiev lost by Russia, mm. evolution of the warfare, precision warfare and stuff, some in Poland started to believe that we could grind down the Russian land forces yeah. to the very end. Yes. And then the intermarium dream reemerged. Mm. And that was the moment, you know, when uh, there is no way back in a way. So when you started talking about accommodation of Russians, yes. Yes. this is not the mood of the street in Warsaw, yeah. as opposed, of course, to the Western, uh, Western capitals. Yeah. And I understand this, but the intermarium countries are on completely right now in a different in a different yeah. setting yeah. and this is will be very important for the future of the european union how the yeah. germans will handle it mm. yes I, I can i can absolutely see that and i guess i mean there's lots there we could obviously talk all night ab 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 about this but 
uh, I mean, I think that the first point is that a Terence failure that you mentioned is really critical. And it does seem to me to be very significant that the United States, notwithstanding that from America's point of view, and I think from the rest of NATO's point of view, one of the key drivers of the end of the opening phase of the crisis was the refusal to 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 make any under, uh, give any undertakings about Ukraine not joining NATO. Nonetheless, uh, right back in November or December last year, as the Russian build up began, Biden came out and said that they would not fight to defend Ukraine. And that does seem to me to be a very significant statement for him to have made, not the wrong statement necessarily, but a very significant statement for him to have made, and one that I think has a lot of resonance here in Asia. Uh, and uh, and the, the apparent confidence that the threat of non-military responses of the sort that we've actually seen would be sufficient to deter Putin um, seems to me to have been, and seemed to me to be at the time, a, a, a very serious miscalculation. Um, and I think that's that's also got resonances here here in Asia. Um, the point about Russia's failure, of course, I think is absolutely right. Russia's position now looks a lot weaker than it, than it did before before February. Um, the, its failure, the failure of the Battle of Kiev, remains to me a rather perplexing mystery. Both why the Russians fought so badly and why the Ukrainians fought so well, or how they fought so well. Um, but sometimes these mysterious things happen, and it'll be very interesting to see the historians unpack that in the uh, in the in the years ahead. But I also think that it's easy at this stage to underestimate. Well, uh, let me put the point the other way: we we still have, we you guys in particular, but we all still have to come to some assessment about Russia's long term strategic weight. And although I think it's had a very bad few months. It still does seem to me that Russia looks and feels like a great power, and uh, and needs to be. You know, it's going to be very difficult to have a stable future for Europe, Europe as a whole, but certainly Europe from where you sit, which doesn't have some kind of accommodation with Russia, and the shape of as I was saying before, the shape of that accommodation now, not just under Putin, but under any imaginable Russian government seems to me to be very hard to discern and it, and of course it's, that's partly russia's problem but it's also partly everybody else's problem as well so. uh, yeah let me let me answer in the following manner just, just to, to shed you the light again of the feeling of the of the political elites here in in poland of course we think that russia is still a great power but to our surprise it's it's uh, you know, misperformance, bad performance of the military, mm. and apparently small size of its military. After Serdukov and Shogun yes. reforms, apparently they they have too small an army to really mm. make any. You know, our leadership for the first time, I remember, realized that Poland can take on Russia on our own if there is war in the east. Mm. Because so far it has always had been like NATO, only NATO, you know, we, we can't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So our leadership, just as we speak, yesterday, I think, or day after yesterday, delivered a speech that we will spend if needed 5% of GDP, but mm. we will feel the, the the one of the most capable militaries in Europe, if not the, the most, yeah. to, to confront Russia. And uh, there is a major push for them military reform and now of course we will open up another chapter whether we can do it whether we are capable yeah. whether we have strategic yes. culture yes. you yes. know all other things that are, yes. are you know go along with it yes. and whether the, the proper there is the, the proper military strategy just as in your book about yes. Australia this is exactly an, an yes. strategy in futures uh, an argument with, uh, I've, with been, I've been thinking about that very question um because it does seem to me that, you know, when we initiated our conversation quite a few years ago now about uh, about the comparisons and contrast between Australia's situation and Poland and so on, and the, the, the arguments I made in my book about how to defend Australia, one of the things that struck me was that a, a difference between Poland's situation and Australia's was that Australia is so well placed to exploit the inherent asymmetries between attack and defence in the maritime realm. And I suggested, I remember in conversations with you, I suggested that 
that Poland doesn't have that asymmetry to exploit because it seemed to me that attack and defence is much more symmetrical in land warfare than it is much more evenly balanced in land warfare than it is in, in maritime warfare. But it, but it, it may well be that one of the conclusions that we should draw from particularly Russia's failure in the battle for Kiev, but also in the, in the relatively slow progress that it's been making um, in, in the Donbass, is that, uh, that perhaps at last we are seeing a restoration of something of the asymmetry between attack and defence, which was so characteristic of the First World War exactly. and which was broken by, by Blitzkrieg. And, and the principles of armoured warfare and, and, and uh, manoeuvre warfare and, and, and all arms operations. Um, I mean, there, there remain some mysteries what, why the Russian Air Force has performed so poorly. I mean, why Russian logistics have performed so poorly and so on. I, I think, I suspect, I mean, I'd be interested in your views on this. I suspect it's partly because uh, the Russian forces were not actually deployed for the Battle of Kiev. They were deployed before the war began for operations much more like the operations they're now undertaking. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to view on this. As, 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 you know, as, as sort of in January and February and March, in January rather in early February, as we watched the build-up and there was much discussion about what was going on, I remember being struck that all of those maps showed um, uh, the Russian deployments in a loop around the, the, that sort of bulge where Ukraine bulges into Russia, so to speak, and they weren't concentrated up there close to, close to the sort of most natural entry point for an attack on Kiev. And I reached the conclusion that, that Russia wasn't planning to do what they in fact tried to do, but was in fact planning to do what they're now doing now. Um, and uh, I wondered if it wasn't one of those situations where the generals prepared for one war and then the rulers yeah. ordered them to fight another one for which they were massively underprepared. So e even then, I think the poor performance of the Russian military is striking. But it does seem to me that that from if 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 we were having now the conversations that we began to have back in 2019 about uh, about uh, how you might apply the the ideas that I developed in my book about Australia to Poland, I'd be much more optimistic about Poland's prospects. Because I do think that 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 the Ukrainians have shown us um, how you can, and you might remember that this was one of the key thoughts behind my book was, was that when middle powers like ours confront great powers, they don't try to win in the sense of occupying the adversary's capital. They try to raise the cost and risk to the adversary to the point where the adversary simply has to give up. And I think that's what Ukraine is trying to do to Russia today, and that's what a Poland could do perhaps to Russia. That's what Australia could manage in relation to China or India uh, in the decades to come if we play our cards right. So I think, th I think it is that there's a lot of very interesting, you know, military strategic, grand military strategic lessons to be drawn from all of this. Yeah, but I, I fully agree. I, I, I share your opinion about the stalemate, like in the First World War Western Front, that maneuver is punished now. And mm, the yeah. uh, fire maneuver is uh, awarded. Yeah. Uh, but the, the fire, uh, you know, overwhelms maneuver yeah. because yeah. of so many sensors. Do what you say. Yeah. So sensors are yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So mass yeah. is quickly yeah. identified yeah. Yeah. and you can kill it. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's, 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 the, it's the combination between improvements in sensing and improvements in hitting. You can find it. And if you can find it, you can hit it. Yeah. And, and it's getting and, cheaper and cheaper. Exactly. And it's, it's interesting, you know, to go back, you know, people commenting on the Yom Kippur War in 73 and the battle along the Suez Canal in the first days of the Yom Kippur War um, uh, did argue then, um, including with the success of the Egyptians using some of the Russian stuff at the time against both Israeli aircraft and Israeli tanks, that, that we'd reached this turning point. And then that sort of faded away and it somehow didn't materialise it. And, and, and I think maybe we're coming back to that again now. Um, and, uh, of course, we haven't seen um, manoeuvre operations on this scale between, um, you know, Western comparable forces. You know, what we saw in Iraq, for example, there's no real comparison. Yeah. But between comparable forces... But um, for a long time. So it's, it's, you know, we're getting a lot of fresh data we haven't had before, and it may well be that what we're discovering, exactly as you say, is in the age of, 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 of mass surveillance and precision strike, 
um, cheap precision munitions um, um, manoeuvre exactly as you say is punished. And uh, that's. And I think one of the interesting things is how the Russians have been forced back to a very traditional Russian artillery-centric form of warfare. Um, yeah, again, that's, that's just like Stoss Truppen during the First World War. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, and, you know, for those of us whose First World War is focused on the Western Front, it all looks very familiar. You yeah, can't that's... move them, so you just line the artillery up, hub to hub, and oh. blast away. True, exactly. So you can punish the maneuver with UAVs, artillery, mining, and stuff. Yeah. Plus, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned asymmetries. This yeah. is critically important because war is all about manipulating asymmetries, you know, yes. in weather, yes. in technology, in numbers, yeah. in yeah. food, in, scale. Yeah. in the different yeah. morale, different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so flows, manipulating flows of, you know, of things. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, at the modern battlefield, where things happen swiftly, asymmetries are rapid yes. and can be rapidly exploited if you control ODA loop, decision-making process, right? Yes. Orientation, yes. decision yes. And apparently, if you have a, you know, a, a military, which might be even smaller, but is highly motivated, it's modern understanding, it has access to data, it can really be winning mm. uh, and I think that was the lesson from the Kiev operation and then yes. also a tactical level the light infantry which is yes. much harder to, to, to find and still it can use the precision munition yes. at, at uh, in numbers it's very difficult to eliminate yes. and so yes it's, it's partly because the the, the transparency of the battlefield, the, the the surveillance situation, applies much more to something that looks, you know, something like a tank yeah. than something like a soldier or even a platoon. Yes. Um, humans are still relatively hard to find. Yes. And uh, with the with the with the hitting power that they acquire through, you know, hand carried precision guided munitions, they really can make a very big asymmetric difference. So I do I do think it's at least as I say, I think we have to be careful to be a little bit agnostic about drawing lessons, but because until we get more information, because you know the fog of war is for real. But I do think there's a there's a chance at least that we're seeing something which is very revolutionary. And I think for Poland and for other, I mean, very very bad news for the great powers and very good news for the middle powers. It's um, it's uh, it it makes one more optimistic about the balance. So that's yeah. that's in a grim in grim circumstances, that's a bit of good news. Yeah. You know, so once we have we have talked about the European situation, yeah. <laughs> you know, tell me what impact it has on the strategic landscape in Asia, if any. Yeah. And, uh, Look, what is going on? Because, you know, I've been focused on Euro Europe now for so long yeah, that I, I can't not, lose track of Chinese developments. Just I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Well, to a certain extent, I mean, one, what one might say is nothing much is happening because we too are focused on what's happening in, in, in Europe. But I think that there, there are a couple of points to make. The, f the first is that um, on the assessment of the, uh, the first point to make is that the, the, the Russia's conduct uh, and, and particularly in the context of the meeting between uh, Xi and Putin just before the invasion took place at the at the Winter Olympics or in the, in the opening of the Winter Olympics, has strongly reinforced what was anyway an emerging view that that Russia and China are so to speak part of the same problem, uh, and that they together constitute a, a, a challenge to the to the global order. Um, I, I think there is something in that, but I think it's easy to exaggerate. But it certainly added, given a stronger sense, both in Europe, in Asia, or at least in parts of Asia, Japan, Australia, in particular, and and in Europe, of a of a co of a strategic cohesion. And we saw that, for example, expressed in the language out of Madrid at the NATO summit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the second the second point to make is that. Um, the the arguments about there's been an argument, of course, about the implications for China's challenge to the United States in Asia of what's happening in Europe, and those arguments have cut two ways. The first is that China will be more constrained in challenging the United States, and more in particular, more constrained by testing 
the United States through a crisis over Taiwan. Now that it's seen how unified the West's response has been to um, to what's happened in Ukraine, and that will that will force China to pull back a bit. Um, the counter argument, exactly the opposite, that is that um, Biden's refusal to go to war over Ukraine, when in some ways you could say the arguments for fighting over Ukraine are stronger than the arguments for fighting uh, over Taiwan, if only because Ukraine is a UN member. <laughs> Um, and recognise an independent sovereign state in a way that Taiwan isn't. Um, that, that 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 argument goes the other way, and that and that uh, uh, Xi seeing the United States so much more engaged in Europe than it was, uh, seeing America's unwillingness to use um, to to go to war over to, over Ukraine, seeing moreover <clears throat> the fact that. Although Europe has been very unified in its response, other key players like India haven't been, um, and many other countries in the third world haven't been, uh, will have, will have, if not encouraged, then certainly not have discouraged uh, the China from continuing to push as hard as they, as they, as they can. Um, I'd say overall that um, as, is keep, as keeps on happening, and I think we've seen it again this week with Biden being in the Middle East, um, America's continuing attempt to persuade Asians that it really is focusing now primarily on Asia keeps on running up against the fact that it has all sorts of commitments um, in other parts of the world which demand a great deal of it. And I do, I do think one of the implications is that however that future settlement with Russia uh, plays out, it does seem to me that America is going to need to if America is going to play any significant strategic role in Europe in the years ahead, it's going to have to play a much bigger role than it expected and intended to, because containing Russia is going to be that much more demanding. And, and that is going to make it harder for America to play the bigger role that it needs to play in Asia if it's going to succeed in pushing back effectively against, uh, against China. Um, one of the faults I see in US policy towards China is they keep on thinking that all they need to do is keep on doing what they've done in the past in order to contain China's challenge. Whereas my argument is that because China's power is growing so steadily, um, uh, America is going to have to do a lot more than it's did in the past. And it's going to be much, and it's going to be very hard for America to do more in Asia at the same time as it's having to do, I think, a lot more in Europe. Yeah. You rightly stated that, you know, the Americans ha will have to be more present in Europe strategically and at the same time grow its uh, presence in, in Asia just to counterbalance China. You know, but so, so far I was thinking that the Americans wanted to have it on the cheap, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder why. Whether, I wonder what you think about it. Because you, you're on the same page. Australia also should think why the Americans do it on the cheap. Because you're also on the, on the receiving end of, of this, yeah. uh, you know, thing. Yeah. Uh, whether this is because the you know the military power application has changed, you can do it you know over the distance. You have space force. You have you know all other things, and this is convenient for the U.S. to 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 to, to be like more offish and and you know come at pace you know in, in mm. times of need. Whether this is because they uh, they think they can manage anyway. And they are so narcissistic and in, in, in thinking like that, you know, that they everybody will <clears throat> always turn to them for help and they don't need to be heavily present. It's like, you know, they don't want to get married, so to speak, and mm. still have a girlfriend, <laughs> right. you know, okay? That's right. uh, and because they think they are good enough to have a girlfriend without, you know, giving a ring, so to speak. They think they'll get everything they want without giving a ring. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Good metaphor. Or third is that the, there are internal frictions and tensions, structural tensions in the US, and they yeah. simply have no so power, no stamina, no funds mm. to to mm. keep on projecting power, you know, as it is required, uh, you know, given all you know the, the, the financial side of the United States. So one of those two, of which of, of one of which you know, which option is more prefer mm. preferable mm. by, by, by you in understanding. Or maybe there are some other explanations, you know. Yeah, look, no, I think I, I think there are, in fact, elements of all three of those. But let me give you my sort of framework for thinking about this. 
it, it does it does seem to me that you know the at the end of the Cold War, America thought about its future and made the decision it was going to continue to be engaged in Europe and going to continue to be engaged in Asia and for that matter continue to be engaged in the Middle East, despite the fact that the Soviet Union was no longer there to be contained. And the, 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 the reason why America reached that conclusion, which it reached by about the mid-90s, was that it believed it was going to be very cheap. And it believed it was going to be very cheap, both because it believed it was going to enjoy an overwhelming domination predominance globally in every dimension of national power. And it believed that none of the powerful states in the world were really going to oppose it, the whole end of history idea, that they all signed up to what was basically a US conception of global order and national organisation. And so the potentially powerful adversaries like Russia and China were just going to, were going to go along. And so with America overwhelmingly preponderant in every dimension of power and no powerful adversary, it's going to be very cheap to sustain this posture. And I think we're still living with the consequences of that because what America is now understanding is that it's not cheap at all, that there are some very powerful adversaries out there, uh, China powerful in every dimension, Russia only powerful in a couple of dimensions, but still powerful nonetheless. And they really don't buy America's vision. They really are determined to contest it. And so, I th and and the, the the problem is that Americans haven't yet had the debate amongst themselves as to whether now it's become clear that preserving their leadership globally is going to be very expensive and rather dangerous. Is it worth their while doing it? Now, it was worth their while during the Cold War because they feared that the Soviet Union was going to dominate the whole of Eurasia, and they had reason to fear that, particularly in the early phase of the Cold War, where China was their ally, India was nothing. Uh, Eastern Europe was already occupied and subjugated. Western Europe was weak uh, uh, with the, you know, all of the devastation of the Second World War. You really, really could argue from Washington's point of view that if they didn't step in to contain the Soviet Union, it would end up dominating the whole of Eurasia and therefore potentially threatening America. And whereas it seems to me that today the imperatives are not nearly as strong uh, because although China is very powerful, it's never going to dominate the whole of Eurasia. It can't dominate India. It can't dominate Russia even. Uh, and it certainly can't dominate a united Europe. Um, and, uh, and neither can Russia. Russia can't either. So it seems to me that America doesn't have anything like the imperative to sustain a global position. Um, a, a, and certainly not an imperative that's strong enough to justify the, the very high costs that it's going to have to pay in order to do so. You know, the cost of successfully balancing America, uh, Russia in Europe, uh, successfully containing China in, in Asia and so on. And the, the, you know, the, 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 the trouble is that, and I think this is one of the really big things in America today, is that the professional elite in Washington still haven't woken up to that, but the electorate outside Washington has. And so you get this weird, I think it's not too much to call it schizophrenia in American policy, whereby when they talk to one another, the policy elites in Washington still talk as if it's 1996 and American leadership is everything. Whereas when they talk to the electorate, as for example, Joe Biden did when he explained the withdrawal from Afghanistan, or, or, when, or the way Donald Trump did when he talked about America first, uh, then it's all about um, resisting commitments overseas, which are going to cost the American people money. And, 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 and the true voice of that was Biden refusing to defend Ukraine because it would unleash World War III. I, th I think that was a very important statement. Uh, it's yeah. not that I think, but, you know, because, you know, see how that applies in Asia. You know, Biden has three times stood up and said uh, we'd defend Taiwan, which, you know, breaching America's own policy of strategic ambiguity. Um, uh, but, of course, defending Taiwan would be World War III. I mean, you know, that it, I think defending Taiwan is much more likely to turn into World War III than defending Ukraine. Um, uh, but uh, but he, doesn't, he doesn't get that. So I, I do think, uh, you know, the sort of policy disconnects in Washington are a very important part of this whole picture. Yeah, but, you know, before we end, if I may just propose oh. sort of a challenging opinion, uh, or at least, you know, I was in DC prior to the war talking to yeah. 
people, some some of the people of importance, especially at, uh, in Trump's administration. And uh, they had fear. They had fear. The fear of the two-front war mm. that is coming. Mm. You know, and if we theoretically assume that the... Oh, of course, we agreed that there was a deterrence failure. But if we theoretically assume that this was a calibrated deterrence failure to really create the situations where Russians were have to do something out of the, you know, this peaceful inf- encroachment of influence to really unhinge the security landscape in Europe and disconnect the, the Germany and France from, from, uh, from uh, Russia and create an impact on the intermarium countries to spend more and break off the continental consolidation between Western Mm -hmm. Europe and This is what happened, you know? Yes. I, I, you know, on the other side, they were all convinced that the Ukrainians will flow, you know, will, will fall within days. Yes. So the Americans were preparing for the insurgency in Western Ukraine. Yes. To sort of, you know, attrit yeah. the Russians there, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So out of the, those two worlds, if this was a calibrated deterrence failure, they even scored a better success because of the performance of the yeah. Ukrainian army. The Russians, yes, yes. And and look what happens at Madrid. China is a threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, NATO sort of, you know, reinvigorated. Sweden and Finland joining NATO, which strengthens United States uh, power in Europe. Intermarium countries spending more. Mm. Short uh, cut off on the energy cooperation. I mean, pressure on German government not to cooperate with China and with Russia anymore, right? Mm. So, you know, um, I'm just, I'm just, you know. Yeah, well, well you, yes. You know what I mean, yeah? You. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I see, I see exactly what you mean. I, I think, and it's a it's a it's a very good hypothesis to entertain. I must say it's a very interesting and challenging hypothesis. But I just make this countervailing point that um, if the United States is really resolved to preserve its position in Europe and Asia, it has to do more than clever things like that. It has to, it has to spend a lot more on defence. Yeah. It it has to it has to really persuade the Chinese and the Russians that it's willing to go to war, risk a nuclear war, to defend its position on, in both of those theatres, the way it did during the Cold War. And in order to do that, the US political leaders have got to go out to American voters the way they did during the Cold War, mm. and explain why in order to preserve America's position in Eurasia, it needs to be willing to, to fight a nuclear war, which would result in nuclear attacks on American territory. I mean, that right at the heart of America's success in the Cold War was its ability, ability to convince its adversaries that it was willing to fight a nuclear war by convincing its own people that it was willing to fight a nuclear war and getting their agreement to that. Now, I just don't see any American statesperson on either side of American politics trying to make that argument. None of them are really arguing for the kind of massive increase in defence spending that America's going to need if it's going to meet China in East Asia. None of them are prepared to argue for, 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 for the, the, the necessity to be willing to fight uh, a nuclear war in order to preserve US, the US position, which is what the United States has to do against both of those adversaries. And so that they, they might be doing that kind of very clever manoeuvre, and I must say I'm, I, I'm very attracted to the, to the artfulness of the scenario you paint, but it just doesn't seem to me to challenge to get to the underlying question of power and resolve, yeah. which, which I think both Russia and China in their different ways present. Yeah, Sorry but, to be a pessimist. <laughs> I, no, no, I understand. I understand because, uh, again, I think it's still a sign of weakness in a way and trying to be a mm. cunning yeah. As opposed to strong, you know. Yes, and, very uh, good. Continuing very on the put. cheap, on the that's cheap. That's beautifully put. Yes, that's beautifully put. Yeah, and I, it doesn't uh, uh, reassure me at all. Even after Biden's speech, 
and I'm finishing. I, I know we are in a hurry. Yes. You know, after because Biden visited Warsaw in yes, the midst, yes. you know, okay. the very important and, speech there. Yeah, and still I was not satisfied as a politician. <laughs> and you know neither, why? Be- neither was because I. I wanted I wanted to hear from Biden how he's equalizing the the stakes of risk between Poland yes. and the United States in keeping yes. the flows of ammo to Ukraine. Yes. And he didn't. Yes. Even even by intentions, he didn't. Yes. I'm not not even about capabilities. He didn't even convey this message in terms of the projection of intention properly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, you know what I mean. So yeah, no, I do absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Now, look, I think I think that's right. And and he didn't. You see, what it, what he doesn't do, what I don't think he can do, is explain to Americans why it's so important to America to yeah. contain Russia and for that matter to contain China. You see, what, what they end up saying is that we have, to pre- we have to do this in order to protect NATO or in order to defend our allies in East Asia. But that puts the cart before the horse. Americans don't, think, don't want to go to war to support NATO. Mm-hmm. NATO's there to support America uh, yeah. and, and, and like, likewise in Asia. And so until an American leader can articulate a really compelling reason why that must why why America's position in these two very contested theaters must be sustained, uh, I, I think it's very hard for us to be confident that it's going to happen. You know, I'm, I, I do in the end <laughs> take democracy seriously. It's pretty hard to get these countries like America, or for that matter, Australia, really engage unless you can convince people that it's really in their imperative really imperative to do so and and that's what that's what biden and i think it's not just a failure of biden himself although i think he is a very weak president but that's what american political leaders find so much difficulty in doing yeah thank you hugh that uh, as always that's been outstanding to talk to you yeah Great to talk to you. I really found this fantastically interesting. I have been thinking about you and and your colleagues a lot over the last few months since February, because I can easily imagine what an extraordinary situation you're all in. But um, anyway, we'll keep watching and keep talking. Let's do this again before too long. Sure. Thank you and enjoy the rest okay. of your day. Thank Take you. Care. Same to you. Enjoy your day. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.